Welcome to another episode of Jews on Film. I'm Daniel, a video editor and documentary filmmaker and still a Jew in this second season. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Harry Ottensaucer. Hey, Harry. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Harry. I am still a film lover, still a former film major and uh, still a Jew. All that remains true in this new season that'll be chock full of surprises, but the intros might not change too much. All that's hopefully going to stay the same. Jen Stewart is joining us today from the Borscht Belt Tatler podcast. Jen, welcome to our season two premiere. Thanks for joining us today. This is so exciting to be a part of a premiere. I didn't, I had no idea. This is very exciting. Yeah, a lot has, has, has passed and changed since our season one finale. Uh, I don't know if you read Deadline today, but they are adapting our podcast um, into a feature film. Uh, Timothy Chalamet is going to be playing Harry. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Not. Oh, wait, is he Jewish? No, he, is, he's not. No, yeah, that's no just, it's I was like, that's keeping up with Hollywood tradition of there not getting Jewish actors. It's a sore to topic play. on this pod. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Harry, I, I yeah. forget who's playing me in, in the adaptation of our podcast. Have, have they cast that yet? I need to, I need to, I'm not up to date on the, uh, on the trades. <laughs> I think there was a short list. You don't remember? You didn't. Was there like, was Leo DiCaprio thrown out? I feel like that was the name I kept seeing. Oh boy. But I don't remember. Oh boy. Oh. Jen, who would play you in the Hollywood remake of this podcast episode right now? <laughs> oh, that'd be easy. Uh, some Jennifer Lawrence for sure. Absolutely. Oh, right on. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't know if we cast ourselves with any Jews in yeah. keeping with the uh, Hollywood tradition. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, Jen, thanks for joining us today. We're going to be discussing Mr. Saturday Night, directed by the great Billy Crystal. Mm -hmm. Thank you for choosing it. And before we get too far into it, I wanted to know, why did you pick this film? I think the most obvious reason is the big Borscht Belt connection, obviously. I do a podcast about the Borscht Belt, and Billy Crystal kind of lit this spark for me, um, you know, between 700 Sundays and just this movie. Um, this movie actually came out in 92, which is when uh, my parents, it was like our second trip to Cutcher's. So I was kind of raised on nostalgia. I, I come from a very conservative Jewish background. My my maiden name is Chayet or Chayet. Uh, <laughs> I married a non-Jew and, and I joke that my podcast is my atonement. Um, haha. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, no, it just, it, it really hits very close to home because a lot of the themes and values that this movie talks about um, really hits home for me. And I just thought it would be the best pick. It was like a no brainer, really. <laughs> Makes sense. Now, for those who have not listened, can you tell us a little bit about what the Borscht Belt Tatler podcast is? Absolutely. So the Borscht Belt Tatler podcast is something I started thinking about during the pandemic. Um, you know, when you're in times of <laughs> stress and peril, you're supposed to go to your happy place. And my happy place is the Borscht Belt. You know, it was a resort destination for mostly Jews to go and it was like a one-stop shop vacation land and it was amazing. It was food, entertainment, round the clock. And, you know, I, I also work in social media and uh, that's my day job. And one of the things I was really noticing just through, as I was trying to learn more about the Borscht Belt and why these places don't exist anymore, people don't really talk about the Borscht Belt. Um, it doesn't come up in conversation so much. Um, it's starting to more, but I felt like there was a really big absence in, uh, like there's no Borscht Belt podcast. So I was like, this is a great opportunity there you go. <laughs> to, to do this because social media, a lot of it is about creating stories and making people care about something. And I feel like 
you know, there's a lot of misconceptions of what the Borscht Belt is and what it isn't. And I feel this was a perfect opportunity to start this podcast, have these people who lived it, worked it, played it, share their memories. And that's literally what my podcast is about. It's people sharing their experiences with these places. And you said you had experience going to the one of these resorts. Which one yes. was that? So I went to Cutcher's Country Club uh, in 1989 and 1992. It was either 92 or 93 and Cutcher's was in Monticello, New York. And one of the last of the resorts to have closed down, closed down in 2012, I believe. And it was just this magical wonderland where you could go and stay and play and entertainers would come. You'd have prize fighters coming like boxers. There were basketball games. Yeah. I just posted um, a story about the Maurice Stokes charity game. Maurice Stokes was a basketball player who got very sick and um, couldn't afford his medical bills. So Milton Kutcher, the owner of this resort got, you know, these basketball players to come together and play these charity basketball games uh, by NBA pros. Uh, and this went on for years. Um, you know, there was no place like it. And it was a different time, a different place. And yeah, really special. I love that you mentioned, you know, it shut down in 2012, because I never thought of myself of having any experience with the Borscht Belt, you know, the way that we've covered it for those who are following the podcast and up to date with the movies, we covered it a little bit with Dirty Dancing, because a lot of time in that film was spent you know, at one of these resorts a couple decades before, you know, the later era we're talking about. But yeah, I didn't I didn't realize I had the same personal connection with it. But you mentioned Kutcher's shutting down in 2012 or so, because I've actually been there before. I went on a school trip in 2013 wow. and I remember it was definitely past the glory days. There was not a lot of entertainment. And yeah, yeah. So um, and I'm interviewing Mark Kutcher, his son, who took over. There's a story behind why, you know, if you did go a little bit later, you know, why it was the way it was. It just, you know, the world changed and, but like, it's so weird because when I went there in the eighties and nineties, it didn't feel like anything changed. Like I wouldn't have known that it was in the decline because yeah. it was literally just so much fun, you know, and freedom. Like kids could run around basically <laughs> be like, bye mom, bye dad. <laughs> you have you a whole resort time. to play with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Amazing. Pretty much. Wow. That is nuts. Is it at all like Dirty Dancing? Um, well, I, I, I'm not that old. <laughs> oh, no, I don't. That's not what I was implying. I'm saying, are there like, are there dance instructors running around, you know, getting up to no good? And I'm told that um, as I talk to people from that era, I mean, again, I was still, it was interesting because when I went, I was a kid, right? So right. I wouldn't have known like the crazy parties. Um, as I talk to more people, yes, I'm told that it was definitely... Um, there were champagne hours and, you know, Jackie Horner, who was actually a creative advisor and she's like a huge kind of figure in the Borscht Belt scene. Um, she was a dancer at, I think it was Grossinger. Someone's going to fact check me, I'm sure. It, but they consulted her for the story because these places, you know, the Latin, there's a whole other topic of like, the Latin um, and Jewish cultures coming together, uh, the mm. Mambo Nicks. I don't know if you right. have checked out that documentary, but there's no. a whole documentary on sort of that, these two cultures coming together, their love of, you know, the Latin Cuban music and Jews just completely taking to it and how the Borscht Belt played a role in that. Short answer is yes. <laughs> Whoa, that's wild. Yeah. Sorry that I missed out, but I'm glad that you both got to experience it. You know, to, to segue clumsily into the film that we're talking about tonight, Mr. Saturday Night. As far as I could check on IMDb, this is Billy Crystal's like feature film directorial debut. Yeah. This is his second outing with the writers from City Slickers, and he went on to do some more films with them. Can I interrupt? Go ahead. No, um, please. I yeah. just really wanted to call attention to Bubba Lou Mandel and Lowell Gans. Like, oh, they are yeah. an incredible incredible writing team like they're basically the writers I wish I could be I mean they they've penned like so many of these very high profile movies over 40 years right like 
huge movies, Splash, Parenthood, Night Shift, um, Vibes with Cindy Lauper. I don't know, because I, I, I've got quite a few years on you. So. <laughs> Uh, vibes with Cindy Lauper is so great. A League of Their Own. Right. Um, you know, they work a lot with Ron Howard. So I just really wanted to just shout them out because they're so, they're such a huge, you know, I don't know. They're just huge in Hollywood and and a lot of the great stories that we love came from them. So. Right. <laughs> they definitely have a certain like tone. And like vibe, especially when working with Billy Crystal, I mean, we can talk about it a lot because we just, you know, we did City Slickers before with Jason Diamond. And like, I noticed there were some similarities. Maybe it's just the time of, you know, the time in cinema, but like the the scores felt very similar in terms of the the moments, you know, the. Mark Shaman. (laughs) Oh, is it the same composer? (laughs) So it's Mark Shaman. Yeah. So Mark Shaman. Like, so it's really funny, you know, Jews on film. This is really a very Jewish film. Like when you look at the creative team and just, I mean, from the writers to the music, um, you know, Mark Shaman, obviously he's award-winning composer for TV and film and theater and um, like he he gets the schmaltz fully. <laughs> like <laughs> totally. Harry, Completely. do you want to hit us? Do you yeah. want to hit Harry? Do you want to hit us with that IMDb summary before we get too far into the episode? Yeah, sure. And I'll just say before I jump into that, how excited I was about this movie, because before, you know, I had watched it and I watched it for the first time recently before this pod, I definitely was expecting another kind of it's it's the movie. It comes out right after City Slickers. And I thought we had a great conversation with City Slickers, but it was a movie that definitely wasn't there was not a lot of Jewishness in the text. And we had to make the case about, you know, the Billy Crystal of it all and his Jewish persona. And I definitely think we, we threw in a couple of stretches just to make the case that that was a Jewish movie, even if it wasn't. Right. And I was not prepared for, you know, just how Jewish explicitly this film was. There's to give a shout out to another podcast. There's this great podcast called the sort of Blake check podcast, where it talks about these filmmakers who, when they have their huge commercial success, you know, they're almost given a blank check by the studio to do whatever they want. And it's where do they decide to go next? And in the post city, Slickers world where, you know, Billy Crystal is this sort of superstar and he kind of decides I'm going to do my directorial debut now and do this. You can imagine very autobiographical in some ways and just very Jewish movie. It's it's so fascinating. And I uh, am very excited to get into the discussion with you guys today. Not to spoil the, uh, you know, in terms of the reception of the film, it seems like as personal of a film as it was to Billy Crystal and those involved, it seemed like Financially, it was not a very successful movie. And it may may be like best left to those who are reviewing films in a Jewish film podcast. But in terms of the mainstream appeal, it was seems like fairly limited. But I'm talking too much, Harry. Why don't you hit us with that IMDb summary? huh? Sure. So uh, I'll get started with that. I found a good one here. It reads, Buddy Young was the comics comic beloved by everyone. Now playing to minuscule crowds in nursing homes, it seems like everybody but Buddy realizes that he should retire. As Buddy looks for work in show business, he realizes that the rest of the world has forgotten the golden days of Buddy Young and that there just may not be room in the business for an old comic like himself. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you, Harry. It's interesting what you're saying about, you know, being given a check and choosing where to where to go with this. And I think what's so refreshing about this is um, this was a character Billy Crystal had been doing since 1984. Um, it was a character that he did on Saturday Night Live, you know, it, or it, it actually first started out on an HBO special. And so he'd been doing this pretty much almost for 10, well, I guess like eight years, math is hard. (laughs) And this is his character. Like this is, and if you watch 700 Sundays that comes up after Mr. Saturday Night, you can see that this is a person. These are stories that he just really, really wanted to tell. And that's why I respect him so much because he's, he did it even regardless of whether or not they were big budget hits. He told the story and now it's a Broadway musical, which, yeah. which is a whole other um, exciting thing, which I'm like super excited about. Um, so that's the only thing I was going to add is just the fact that he had been a character Billy Crystal had been doing prior to uh, this movie. Well, we could discuss the uh, Broadway adaptation in our subsequent podcast, Jews on Broadway. Uh, but for now, <laughs> let's take a quick break no, sorry. <laughs> and we'll be right back with the discussion of Mr. Saturday Night.
Welcome back to the season two premiere of Jews on Film. We are discussing Billy Crystal's Mr. Saturday Night. And Daniel, why don't you start walking us through the plot a little bit? Sure thing. I mean, the film opens with a fairly uh, unique title sequence. I believe it was designed by Saul Bass, which is like a notable graphic designer. He did a lot of Hitchcock films and things like that. And you're expecting this sort of really sophisticated thing, but you're, you're watching like food prep happen. And so it's like a lot of picking apart turkey and doing the mashed potatoes and prepping food and chopping this and that. And then all through the intro of the film, you're hearing Billy Crystal as Buddy Young just tell his jokes. And they're just like groaner jokes, just like, oh, God, that's like very dad joke kind of thing. And dances and with Jews. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's just a lot of it. And then, you know, we start with him as an old man, I believe. And, you know, sort of a device that is used throughout the film is we're flashing back from, you know, Buddy Young is a older person at the beginning of the film. He's got his old man makeup. His his brother is David Pamer. He plays Stan Young. I will say that David Pamer in old man makeup kind of looks like David Pamer now as an old man <laughs> because <laughs> the time that has passed. Billy Crystal, I feel like the makeup at the time was not as sophisticated, so he doesn't quite look. He was really young. He was like only 40, I think, when right. he was filming it. So. so it's a bit of a stretch. That opening sequence I was going to mention is I, I think it's such an interesting intro because Again, I went into this movie not appreciating how Jewish it was going to end up being. And as, the, you know, as he's doing his jokes, the jokes aren't specifically Jewish. It's about food. It's about eating a lot. And then all of a sudden you're watching this montage play out with the food. And at first I was like, oh, it's just, you know, scraps of chicken and things like that. And then you start seeing the brisket and then you start yeah. seeing the matzo ball soup. And yeah. I was like, oh, we're. Can I ask, what were your what were you feeling when you when you saw that? Like, were you did you get excited a little bit? <laughs> Did you feel seen? I did. It was familiar. Yeah. yeah. I was like, right. that's a good looking soup. I kinda, I've had soup that looks like that before. Right. Yeah. Was this like a Friday night dinner? Is this like a special holiday? Like just See, a regular? I, I re completely related it to like Friday night dinner, yeah. you know, family dinners, right? Because those first few minutes, you realize that food is love in this family. And, you know, that's one of the values here and being together as a family and also being pulled into that you know, New York Jewish immigrant experience, because like many before him, you know, he's, you know, and he talks about it. It's, you know, he was the child of immigrants who came to this country. And, you know, it even says, you know, Yiddish, the, la the language of coughing and spitting, you know, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> like that's direct quote from the movie, uh, which is true. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and it's funny because it's true. I think that food did did more to culturally sort of ingrain us in the Jewishness of it all and in the family and in the immigrant, you know, that that kind of aspect of it all so much more so than if, you know, we saw people wearing yarmulkes or, you know, they started busting out the Yiddish, which all of that eventually comes in the movie. But I think there's a it's a real love letter to that culture, to that past, just in the, that montage of food, you know, totally. and, and like you said, the food is that is really that love language. And, you know, there's great payoffs for that later on in the film. Yeah, I will say, though, not a lot of keep us in the film. I did take note that when he does get married later on, he does step on glass, but is not wearing a keeper. I noticed but the same thing. Not to tip my hat too much. My old man, I'm wearing an old man hat, by the way, Harry, in honor of <laughs> Billy Crystal today. I believe the film starts off and he he go, we go right into his show, right? We he He's running around his brother's constantly telling him to wear the other jacket because it's funnier and running. I, I was very reminiscent of kind of in broadcast news, Harry, if you remember that scene, the sort of frenetic editing behind the scenes. But then as soon as the cameras turn on, he pops out on stage. But, you know, he kisses his family, his mom's in the dressing room and his wife and his daughter. And, you know, it's just a it's a very chaotic introduction to this person's life. But we do get to meet everyone in sort of quick succession. And I think it sort of lays out the dynamic that, you know, his family's here and he's kissing his mom and everybody. And, and then he goes out on stage and he does his jokes. And, you know, this is sort of the, I would say the peak of his career. We start out at the peak of his career and then downhill from there. But uh, any thoughts on the opening? Opening up on, on this family and it does a bit of back and forth, but I also like how, you know, they start as the Yankelman brothers. Right. And then from the Yankelman brothers, they go to, he, he becomes Buddy Young right. from Yankelman. This isn't going to work, A.B. This is not the living room. They don't know Uncle Mo. They don't speak Yiddish. It's not going to be funny to them. <laughs> it is funny. We're going to make it funny. No, we're leaving. We're going home. What? Stay. 
Stan. Stan? If we can't go, I already changed our names. What? Yeah, yeah. We're Stan and Buddy Young. See, the Yankelman was too long. What? And... It's better. No, look, you... We don't belong here. We're funny at home. So I actually brought a quiz for Ooh. you both. Okay. Um, a surprise pop quiz of the oh. Jewish comedians who changed their name. So I'm going to give you their Jewish name and you're going to tell me who they what? are. This is unprecedented. I did I not know. sign up for I this. I just, I've been dying to do this because okay. it will blow your mind. Are you guys down for that? Sure. Can I have my Google browser And if browser you're wrong open? and you feel oh, embarrassed. Hands up, hands up, Harry. Hands up. Come on now. <laughs> You can edit. <laughs> okay. I will not we'll edit this in post. We'll yeah, get them all yeah. hands up so exactly. we're not Googling. Okay. <laughs> Who is Nathan Bierenbaum? Hmm. Nathan Bierenbaum. Uh, can we get like an approximate uh, decade? I'll give you. <laughs> Harry, I'll nail it down. Harry, he Harry. had a cigar. Oh, uh, George Burns? Yeah. Uh, very good. There you go. Um, Andrew Clay Silverstein. Oh, I'm giving that easy. one away. This is for you, Harry. Andrew Dice Clay? Oh, I don't know. Is that right? Oh my God. Am I like totally throwing you off? <laughs> is it Andrew Dice Clay? <laughs> it is Andrew Dice Clay. Uh, David Daniel Kaminsky. Hmm. David Daniel Kaminsky. Hmm. I don't know. Harry? I don't know if you don't got it. There's a low, there's a low chance. <laughs> I'm the old man here. So I'm pitching it to me is gonna have, yeah is gonna be successful. There's there's a lesson to this. I feel I feel like the agent in that later scene in the movie where she's oh, sitting yeah. down with Buddy totally just yeah. throwing totally. out names yeah, yeah. and she's yeah. just, she's just Helen loss. Hunt. Yeah, she's just like Helen nope. Hunt exactly. Yeah, the ITI but, but, agent. Yeah, but but and the lesson is you know people always love to say that Jews run Hollywood. Um, Jews had to change their names a lot right, yeah. to get into Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know? So I'll give you the full list here. John Stewart is Jonathan Stewart Leibowitz. Jackie wow. Mason was born Yaakov Mos Moshe Meza. Mel Brooks was Melvin Kaminsky. Lenny Bruce was Leonard Alfred Schneider. Milton wow. Berle, Mendel Berlinger. Ronnie Dangerfield was Jacob Rodney Cohen. Like, a Cohen. And so, wow. And so, you know, you see this Buddy Young Jr. And I'm just like, yeah, he's totally taking that experience of these Jewish comics who went through that and bringing it to the screen. So I just really wanted to add that in there because I feel like it's just really relevant to the plot. Totally. <laughs> to the character. No question. You are setting a dangerous precedent for future guests of season two of Jews on Film. That they I just have want to bring people to quiz. listen to my podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think they will <laughs> after this. I told, the, I told the audience they'd be surprised. And I'm really hoping something. Billy Crystal might hear this. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Billy, come on the podcast. We'd love to have you. So yeah, um, no, I'm not delusional. Uh, no, anyway. no, that was that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for the quiz. Uh, a couple of things to call out just at the beginning of the film. They were walking through the TWA terminal, which is a, you know a, near JFK, which is now like a boutique hotel. They've revenged that, and uh, so that made me sort of nostalgic for a New York that I did not know because yeah, I, I wasn't there at the time. Yeah. But kind of early on, Stan Young. David played by David Paymer. Uh, he kind of retires from managing his brother's career and his life about 15 minutes into the film. And he's done, you know, he doesn't want to have anything to do with the business anymore. He wants to go to Florida and see his grandkids. And that's not something buddy understands because he has a daughter that he's sort of estranged from. And he's really put everything he has into his career. As we find out more into the film, we see pictures on the wall and things like that. We can see that this, career is his life. Even his wife understands that at some point. But I think that is sort of, to me, the inciting incident of the film, which is like Stan retires, which triggers this whole flashback of them getting into comedy, doing the talent show, changing their name, like you said, Jen, performing for the family, playing with mom's arm flaps, all sorts of weird, funny gags. But uh, yeah. that's sort of what kicks it off, I think. Yeah. Dan, you mentioned that this was a kind of persona that Billy Crystal had been working with, uh, you know, on HBO, Saturday Night Live, kind of in the past. And um, it, it definitely came off a little bit, his his humor, you know, his comedy. And it's born out of kind of his, you know, sort of insulting his family to a certain extent that it was a little bit mean spirited, a little bit, you know, insult humor. There's always one or two people he's pulling out of the crowd and, you know, making usually it's weight jokes or something about yep. how they're dressed. Yeah, yeah. And the, 
Yeah. And I'm not sure, you know, how do you think an audience was supposed to feel about this comedy watching this, you know, when the movie came out, were we supposed to feel a little bit uncomfortable or is that just my more, my more modern lens kind of saying, or don't insult everyone that you're speaking to. So it's a really, I'm so glad you bring that up because it's a really interesting conversation of sort of where comedy came from versus where we are now, because Mm -hmm. we talk a lot about um, comedy I mean, especially now, just, you know, who should really be the butt of the jokes? You know, we look at current comedians who are making, you know, pretty transphobic remarks. And if you look back on the history of comedy, um, I kind of I'm always like (laughs) another comic is canceled. I run and hide all of my comedy albums because some of them are very problematic and would not fly today because of because we have changed this as a society. But yeah, I think Buddy Young is very he his problem and yet his talent is you know, he has a comedic gift, but it also, he's good at alienating the people that he loves, which is, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. You know, he's able to make a living for it, but then in turn, it kind of, the irony of that is it pushes the people he loves away. His estranged daughter, uh, his brother, you know, even his brother says, you know, buddy, my whole life, I listened to you bellyache about your luck. Well, you are where you are because of who you are. Right. And like that is that moment where we realize he has this, it's a curse and a blessing. And people are gonna be like, oh, we're gonna cry for the rich comedian. It's like, well, <laughs> no, but you have to understand it's it's um a lot of the people who go up and do the comedy are hurt like it's from pain you know right Uh, especially the comedians back then it was all about um trying to make sense of their identity and trying to um you know being the child of immigrants and trying to fit in in a world that was completely um deeply rooted in anti-semitism and one of the things that makes him so appealing like you said is his ability to turn everything around and make it a joke but like you but like his brother wisely said and you said he can't turn it off, right? I mean, he's getting interviewed by a potential agent for business. He can't stop making jokes. He's interviewed for this or that. He can't stop making jokes. He's being auditioned for a potential role. He can't stop making jokes and be serious. Like, I found that to be such a hard thing to kind of, it made me so frustrated, right? Because I wanted to see him succeed. But ultimately, you can't root for someone who doesn't want to be successful themselves. And you know, it remind, not to call back another episode, but it did also remind me of Uncut Gems because he keeps on getting him in the, in the way of himself. You know, he gets so, a stack of money. My then, Uncut Gems story is I just watched that movie yeah. and it, it was such a pile of dreck. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I, just, I, I That's really fair. did. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. I wanted it. That's how I felt watching that movie. I yeah. really wanted to like it. I did right. not like it. That's fair. You know? <laughs> Sorry. I, no, it's okay. Safety <laughs> Brothers are probably not going to be on the Borscht Belt Tom anytime yeah. soon, unfortunately. Exactly. We try to no, keep our options can't. open, Jerry. We love every movie. I'm sorry. It's no, too no. much. It's too much. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Right. No, I think what I, I guess what I was trying to say is that, like, it's mostly about the fact that, you know, they're just getting in their way so much and they are, you know, you try to root for them, but they're unlikable in some degree. And it really makes it difficult to kind of root for them in some, in one scene, they're doing great. And they they say something really enlightening and they connect with somebody else. And, and in another scene, they just kind of screw themselves up and they really um, get in their own way about it. But most yeah. comics too, were very self-destructive too. Absolutely. I, I thought there was a really enlightening comment made by Elaine in a later scene when she's talking to Stan and she tells him that she's like, I can give Buddy all the love in the world. But until he's kind of receiving that ovation from strangers, you know, it, right. it'll never be enough. And it's sure. it's almost like he doesn't he's resists making these connections with the people that he loves and with people he's intimate with. He wants a, a relationship with strangers, something that is purely just laugh at the jokes I'm telling you, let me amuse you and and nothing deeper. And he doesn't let, you know, anyone really penetrate that until, you know, there, there's a little bit of redemption by the end of it. But 
you know, there is something that, and I don't know if this is true for all comics or if this is just something about his persona and, you know, how he's been using these jokes as a barrier and as this way to, you know, connect to a stranger, but to kind of shut himself out. You know, anytime someone makes a comment, brings up something serious to him, he is just, his jokes are a mile a minute. You know, yeah. everything is like, I'm just kidding. But this, like, well, what are you getting upset? I'm just kidding. And it's, you know, he, he's not letting himself make a connection with anyone. He wants everyone to be strangers to him. Yeah, I think there was a nice conversation. Him and his brother are sitting in the park and they basically just are going back and forth. Also, I'm seeing a woman. What, like through a window? You're like <laughs> Boris Becker here. I'm, I'm hitting lobs and you're smashing them back at me. No, really, you're seeing a woman? Yeah. What, like on dates? Yes. We go to the theater, we go to dinner. Has she seen we... those steam clams you call balls? Buddy, you're a child. You're a big, wrinkled child. What, what is the matter with it's you? It's not a matter. I'm just playing. I'm worried about you, Stan. For God's sakes, there's all of these sexually transmitted diseases out there. Most of which you started. <laughs> Double off the wall. Come on, <laughs> we'll sit down on your lap here. Constantly critiquing each other about the jokes and how well they did and things like that. But going back to the story, you know, as we're going back and forth between Buddy and his brother Stan kind of working on their modern day relationship, we go back and forth and we see him go out on the road and then he meets someone, they get married, he starts to play Vegas, you know, they're putting their daughter to bed in a crib and then they go to the bathroom and they, uh, you know, they have a romantic dinner on the toilet with candles. We're missing the part where he actually meets his wife, which is in the Catskills. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, tell us about that. That's the Borscht Belt. That's like the best part of the movie. So yeah, so he's, I don't know if he's playing Grossinger. I I don't even know where he's playing, but he's playing somewhere in the Catskills, in the Borscht Belt, during the Borscht Belt era. And, you know, he's doing his, uh, his, you know, it used to be very hip to tell jokes with, you know, the punchline in Yiddish, that was like a big sort of thing. We take you, <clears throat> we take you now to a, uh, a uh, the final scene at the end of the movie King Kong, where uh, the great ape is, is lying at the base of the Empire State Building. And we turn to, uh, to Carl Denham, Mr. Denham. Was it the machine guns that killed him? Machine guns? Feh! Sis Gavaina Shikse! And he sees, you know, his wife to be sitting in the audience and gets his brother to kind of play matchmaker to get them together. So she convinces Stan, convinces Elaine to go and, you know, meet Buddy backstage. And my, the best line in the movie is, Elaine, these sandwiches are amazing. Roast pork, get that kosher. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> So you have to understand that sandwich was like very, very, if you experienced the borscht belt, roast garlic pork on garlic bread was a delicacy for Jews, believe it or not. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Jews that sounds wild. heretical. Wow. That's a different <laughs> podcast we host. Jews Gone Wild is our third spinoff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just such a great scene because it's so iconic and uh, the important plot point. So is that when the lights kind of shut off at the end and they're kind of under that gazebo, that romantic gazebo? Yeah. And she like lets out a huge belch from like, which I can also relate to because, you know, Jews and their gastrointestinal uh, (laughs) issues, a hundred percent. Totally. Like totally relatable. I think that scene (laughs) features, you know, his, his, his performance at the, uh, at the hotel. Like I think it features probably his most successful comedy bit of the entire movie. You know, even when we see him like on his show, which you could say is sort of the peak of his fame, Mm -hmm. He's never really engaging with the audience quite the same way he is. And they make comments throughout the film about how, you know, people say, oh, you could have been bigger. You know, maybe if your brother Stan wasn't managing you, you could have had bigger gigs and you could have blown up. But, you know, his form, his his comedy, like it is connects so specifically with this Borscht Belt crowd. You know, the first time he goes on, which is much earlier in the film, he says to his brother, like, are they going to get it? We're going to be doing Yiddish. Like, is that going to work? But like this, this is his audience here in the scene, you know, here in the heart of the Borscht Belt, that is where his comedy is sort of you know tailored for where it connects the most and you know like you you just see that i think that's really transmitted through the scene through the screen absolutely yeah. yeah he totally connects with the audience both you know in their younger years but then later on in the film when he's playing like a retirement home and he's playing for like an older audience you know potentially maybe the same people 
uh, work right. clientele from both. But uh, yeah, I think it's interesting seeing him among his people is where he seems to shine best. But as he progresses, you know, he gets more successful. He starts to play various venues in Vegas. He has a daughter. He brings his daughter out on the road. And then as we're going back and forth, you know, in his later years, you know, he connects with, a, he reconnects with his old friend who's an agent and he's trying to get more work, right? Because at, at this point in his life, in his sort of golden years, his work has dried up. Like you mentioned before, Jen, the Borscht Belt is not a thing anymore, even in the 90s at, you know, in this world. And so he's hitting up his friend and kind of telling him about how generous he was and he was giving money to people and this and that. And so he sets up a meeting with an agent played by Helen Hunt, who's potentially going to get him some work. And they, so Helen Hunt does get him some commercial gigs and he kind of blows it at every opportunity. It seems like yeah. you know, he doesn't take him seriously. She's looking out for him. She's trying to get him some work. They go through his apartment. They look at some photos. She gets to know him. She puts up with his bad jokes His, you know, that's one thing that I was just like so frustrated about. Cause here, this person is trying to help him out and he just can't stop like joking and just like opening he up to, stick to the script. Yeah. He wants to improvise and he's trying to be a warm up comic and he makes fun of the host's hair and things like that. And it's, it's just so frustrating. And yeah, I just found myself like gritting my teeth being like, shut up and just read the lines. You know, it's like, uh, I know that yeah. frustration, you know? No, it's, it's so true. Like even there's like a part in the movie too. And like the TV rating starts to slip. Right. And he, so he blames Davy Crockett. There's that whole you know, bit where he then goes and makes fun of Davy Crockett and how Crockett and everybody in the Alamo was probably gay. And so breaking the, you know, again, just breaking it down with nastiness and in as the sort of self, just it's kind of like, all right, well, the ship's sinking. Let's just blow it up anyways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I think the self-destruction is, is perfect because like you were saying, it's his greatest sort of, it's his best, it's his best asset. And it's He's his, his own worst enemy. Because, <laughs> and it's true. Like if you're going to make an entire career kind of insulting and putting down everyone around you, you can only rise so high. It, it got him to a certain point, but right. obviously you know, that that has to sort of get in its own way. And that's why later on in his career, when he's older, he's just he's kind of burned all those bridges and he just cannot let himself, you know, he can't humble himself enough to make any new connections. And, and that's one thing like I the tagline to, of the movie, too. It's be, it's lonely yeah. at the middle. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly where he is. I also wanted to mention before we moved past that scene where he's kind of when the ratings are going down that Davy Crockett, there's you know, there's this whatever he's walking around behind the scenes and he's kind of it's, it's clear he's made enemies with everyone. And one of the first things he does is he fires you know, a group of writers because he right. says you ruined, you know, you've changed my monologue, even though his brother Stan had told them to change the monologue because it was so, you know, insulting to, sure. to the ratings. But one of the, one of the, one of his writers that I know he, he says, he's like, who are you writers anyways? Like you're all fired. And then one of them says, come on, Woody, let's go. And this guy exactly. turns around and you get a brief <laughs> second of like a Woody Allen, like face with like the iconic glasses. There you go. And I was like, that's a nice little like Jewish comic tease. This, this movie was doing its little nod. So oh, I appreciated no, that. 100%. That they were completely in it and they yep. literally, it's, it's almost as though they like, just like we're ticking off all the boxes right. of everything. The, the that movie they... is like an ode to Jewish comedy. It really, it really is. is. Totally. Yeah. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, that the writers of the film, Lowell Gaines and Bob Lou Mandel played those two writers. Is that right? It wouldn't surprise me. I, I, I want to say yes, but I'm, I, I can't remember. So it's all good. <laughs> On one of his commercial shoots, Buddy is working or trying to work and his brother Stan comes back from Florida to find him. And it turns out that his mom, their mom has passed away. So they go and reconnect and they, you know, they go back for the funeral. Uh, they, I don't know. I would like to talk a little bit about the, the funeral prayer. I thought that was kind of a nice ode to, uh, you know, the Jewish roots. Uh, Harry as the resident expert of melodies and tunes and customs. What did you think of the funeral prayer? 
I thought it was nice. It was, you know, as, as culturally Jewish as this movie was, it didn't take so much time to be, you know, I guess liturgically Jewish and right. you know, go into some of the prayers and some of the specifics. And we mentioned this at the top, but this was one of the only scenes in the movie where they start putting yarmulkes on the characters' heads. Right. And it was nice for them to take, you know, a couple minutes to really do, I thought, you know, a, a pretty nice honor to, you know, the Jewishness at the heart of the character. So I actually really appreciated the scene. You know, it's I think it's really one of the climactic sort of hearts of the film. I, I don't think that... You know, I think the final sort of confrontation resolution, you know, his character coming around does continue to happen later. But mm -hmm. there's definitely this moment where uh, they're, they're at the funeral. And I guess, you know, for all the funerals I've ever been to, I've always thought that people had prepared speeches. But there's this right. moment where, you know, the rabbi kind of looks at the crowd and says, if anyone wants to speak, you know, now's your chance. And Stan and, you know, Buddy kind of go back and forth. And he's like, you know, Stan's like, Buddy, you know, it's all you take it. And he has this beautiful moment where he for the first time, I think in the film uses his comedy to connect with an audience. And mm -hmm. it's still in some ways at the expense of his mother. He's kind of laughing about her. I mean, his opening sure. joke I thought was very sweet because he said, you know, my brother Stan first told me that our mother had passed away. My first thought was, did you get her recipe for Kugel? <laughs> the woman lived in the kitchen. You know, it's the same thing we were talking about food, just sort of being this great connector. And there's this moment where, you know, he's like looking around and he's not kind of laughing at the expense of the audience. He's really, you know, bringing them together around, you know, around some of the humor around his mother, around her. You know, he laughs about her huge arms, which, again, is a little bit critical at first. But then he says, you know, but when they hugged you, it was the safest place to be in the world. And I, I just thought there was something I, I really thought it was like very effective to leverage both you know, his cultural and familial background and his Jewishness and, you know, kind of convert his comedy in this, you know, one scene to just be really, I don't know. I just, I just found it very endearing. And I think it's this like emotional point in the film where all of a sudden it feels like things are going to turn around for him because it's like, Oh, he's really connecting with his family again. Maybe he's going to take his career seriously. Like hopefully he's going to get some perspective and, you know, yes and no. I think we see, we come to see in the next couple of scenes. I mean, there's that saying too in Yiddish. It's like, what, what is it? Laughter's, tears and healing I don't remember the whole saying but there mm -hmm. is a Yiddish saying and I think you know that also spoke to me very you know it's it's just one of those very real moments because I think you know even at a funeral you know some people cope with laughter right. that's just a coping mechanism right so I just thought it was a really beautiful scene as well and 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 totally agree like he was definitely you know, you could see, you know, something shifted in him yeah. uh, with this loss. You can see that there's, you know, something is changed. There's, there's a, there's a shift. And, and obviously um, I don't want to jump ahead either, but he reconnects with his daughter. Right. So. Right. Of course. Right. And I think, yeah, that's maybe the thing that comes out of it. Cause as Harry alluded to, you know, he still gets in his way quite a bit you know, professionally, you know, he receives a big inheritance from his brother, which is from their mother. They ha they gave a check. It seems like Stan has done pretty well for himself investing over the years. And so he doesn't necessarily need the money, but Buddy has not done the same. And so he passes over the check to, to Buddy and then Buddy eventually gives it to his daughter, who he reconnects with later. As he is being put around on these various auditions and commercials and things like that. Helen Hunt's character, Annie Wells, uh, introduces him to very famous director, Larry Meyerson, played, like you said, Jen, by Ron Silver. And this is the role of a lifetime for Buddy. You know, Larry grew up idolizing Buddy and wrote this part with Buddy in mind. And so they meet in a in a cafe and they they bond and they end up auditioning. He ends up auditioning for this role. And Stan kind of helps him a little bit. But when he gets to the audition, unfortunately, some bad things happen. Yeah, he blows it. Yeah, well, okay. I'll try to leave it open to get a little bit more dramatic with uh, telling the story here. But, you oh, know. sorry. No, no, it's totally fine. It makes sense. He absolutely blows it, I think. you know. And acts like a schmuck. Like, yeah. There's no way, there's no fancy way to really dance around it, You're right? You're totally right. I do think, though, it, it's one of the more nuanced scenes in the movie because when the scene opens, you know, he's expecting to read for the lead part and the right. director has kind of told him, I've, you know, grown up idolizing you and you put me onto, you know, film when I was 
seven years old because you told a joke that I thought was so funny. And he says, I've written this role exactly for you. And even the way that, you know, Buddy eventually performs the lines, it's it's no different from any of the delivery he's done throughout the rest of the film. Like it really does feel like it was built for him. But when he gets originally to this audition, he's told that they had actually, you know, behind his back cast someone else in that lead role. And they were going to give him... Exactly. And they were going to give him this, uh, this, you know, sort of second, not even secondary, this like minor role of a doctor that, you know, maybe had three pages of okay lines, but that's it. And on one end, you know, as much as Buddy would then later implode and kind of, you know, go off on everyone and cost himself a shot. On one end, you are a little bit sympathetic to the fact that this really did feel like a big break for him. And it it honestly, I'm not, you know, I wasn't so sympathetic with the director kind of going behind his back. Like he he says, you know, that's show business. Yeah, it's a little bit. And what I think is so cool about this is that, you know, after that big blow up and after he kind of yells at the director and says, you know, I should have had that lead role and this, you know, you screwed me over here. You know, Stan kind of confronts him and says, you messed this up again. And again, I, I'm at this point, I'm a little bit sympathetic to Buddy because, you know, he really wasn't a terrible situation. Like it was kind of a little bit unfair, but Stan calls him out. Everybody gets screwed, Buddy. Everybody got shit upon, got bad breaks. That is part of the business. That is part of life. You took every bad break you ever got and you made it worse. You got to burn your bridges behind you and under you and in front of you, every bridge. (sighs) Buddy, my whole life I listened to your bellyache about your luck. Well, you are where you are because of who you are. And that I thought was really nuanced because as much as he's getting in his own way, like it's not like everything was perfect. It's not, I don't think it's quite the same as sort of an uncut gems where he really was screwing himself over despite how successful he was. Sure. Like, but he was someone who really had these, you know, lofty ambitions, these big dreams. And there were a lot of things that were standing in his way of getting there. But, you know, like I think Stan appropriately calls out the way he dealt with them and the way he failed to find happiness and failed to make connections and failed to be a nice person, quote unquote, you know, to anyone else besides himself is really what marks him, I think, as such a challenging character throughout the film. And he even mentions that he like that's that's the line. He's like, yeah, but you could have been nicer. That's exactly like, right. That's exactly that's what he yeah. says. He's like, you, you could have been nicer. And yeah. it's true. And I think what's also very real about it is when you get to to be a certain age, it gets harder and harder to change. So we're not going to see this miraculous like, sure. OK, he's a changed man. He's going to get this part and it's going to be happy. You know, because that wouldn't be true to who his character is either, right? Yeah, I mean, throughout the film, he seems to be given these opportunities, whether it's a talk show or opening up for someone else or auditioning for a foreign commercial or being even in a bit part, I think, you know, a different person. If on that day when they were auditioning, you know, back when they were kids and it was Stan who decided who was going to be the main Mr. Saturday Night and maybe Buddy was, the way. Maybe the, if the roles were reversed, I feel like David Pamer's Stan would be a lot more calculated in his career and would have a much better understanding of how to balance the comedy with the career ambitions, you know? It's hard to say because he didn't go towards the fear, right? Because if you think back to sort of what ended up happening was he, he, he choked, right. He, and, and from there it was his buddy who went on and, and it was that sort of chance. It was, you know, the timing and the ability to go forward when he couldn't. So it's, it's hard to say, because again, the things that made him a, such a strong performer, are the things that were sort of self-destructive in the end. Right. Totally. Yeah. And Stan, I think just by the end of it, you know, when he retires and he goes on to paint, like he clearly is artistic. He clearly yeah. was oh, you yeah. know, part of the arts, but he chooses something which definitely doesn't involve live performance in front of an audience. You know, it's a very meticulous performance, so to speak, of just sitting alone in his, you know, he says there's a great spot where he can sit outside a window and just paint in the afternoons by himself. And eventually he'll present that to an audience, but you definitely don't get the impression that he could have, you know, in in some ways he he didn't have what Buddy had, which allowed him to connect at least on the surface level with other people in a way that he couldn't. Yeah, definitely. And they're both solitary, you know, professions, right? Being a, yeah. a landscape or or portrait artist and then also being a comedian. Because, I mean, despite having so many people in his orbit, I would say Buddy is a solitary 
kind of worker. He does have family. He does have quote unquote friends, but he kind of goes it alone. He sits in his dressing room in his bathrobe and his hat. And he's, he's at peace when he's by himself until he goes out on stage. And even then he's by himself on stage performing for an audience of people. So after he does kind of biff the audition and doesn't get the part, you know, after talking with his brother and his agent who advise him to go for the part of the doctor, he ends up not taking it. They have a big argument and he does leave and he does find his daughter and reconnect with her, you know, throughout the film, they have kind of a patchy relationship. She's the butt of some of his jokes and things like that. But at the end, he gives the check to her. They kind of make up and they try to make amends. And I think that's where we end the film. Is that correct? More or less? More or less. And then he ends up going to Florida. <laughs> he ends up going to Florida and performing for folks at an old age home. Is that correct? It's true. And yeah. They enjoy it. Great. So which kind of opens that whole sort of conversation of, you know, he still gets his audience, right? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. full circle. And in some yeah. ways, you know, he tried going things a different way, but you know, he 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 ends up right sort of back where he started instead of being the at the more of the story is the borscht belt shouldn't have gone away. That's there it is. I knew that'd be your takeaway for sure. Jen. If there's one thing that's people should take from this episode. The story. For sure. Understood. Look what you did. No, that's not the moral of the yeah. story. There, there's a great moment though at the end, you know, when he, uh, he gets that painting and I thought it was really well done the way that Stan kind of has this painting and he presents it to Buddy and, you know, it's kind of covered and you don't know if we're going to see it. And then, you know, Buddy says, can I open it? And he goes, yeah, why not? And he, he peels it away and they don't show it to the audience at first. They kind of close the movie on, you know, when on actually showing us what's there. And what I loved about that scene is that, right. And for those who, you know, made it this far in the podcast, I'll I'll spoil exactly the very, the last moment, but it's a, it's a painting basically of, of a rendering of one of the early scenes chronologically we've seen in the film of them, the two of them performing together for the first time, surrounded by family, you know, their mother is kind of at the front of the frame and, you know, they're all with her, with her huge arms and they're all watching together. And, you know, in terms of growth, because I agree with what you were saying, Jen, at at a certain age, people get older, you know, they stop growing and there isn't a full turnaround, even, even the scene where he reconnects with his daughter, like he doesn't go into the house with her. He doesn't talk to her for longer than, you know, a couple of minutes, but at least there's something subtle, but right. And meet people and and you have to meet people where they are. Right. And that's exactly what happens, I think. And, and, and that's why that moment with the painting I thought was so effective because, you know, we've, we've been talking about this throughout the pod and, and Daniel, we were discussing this before, but he is just incapable of receiving anything earnest or anything genuine without just cracking a joke and without throwing something away. And when he, when he's shown the painting for the first time, when he sees it, his, his response is, it's so simple. It's just, he says, it's good. It's very good. You know, and just that kind of earnestness with his brother, the first time that he's not like, yeah, like every other time he sees his brother, he's insulting, he's calling him ugly, he's making fun of him, he's insulting something. And just for him to just say, it's good, it's very good. And to be clear, so clearly moved by it, that to me was like the perfect kind of wrapping to everything that uh, that had happened in the film until that point. Well, what a terrific film. Why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back and we'll rate the film according to its Jewish content, Jewish themes, and, you know, whether or not this film was good for the Jews. All that and more. We'll be right back after these words from no sponsors. And now the moment we've been waiting for. We are back on Jews on Film to discuss Mr. Saturday Night with Jen Stewart from the Borscht Belt Tadler podcast. Welcome. It's my back. fault. I have such a confusing name for a podcast. It's it's quite the mouthful. Yeah, so that's I all apologize. Right. It's all good. It's all good. Forces you to write it down. Exactly. And revisit it. So it, it works. It'll haunt your dreams. <laughs> exactly. I'll listen to it as I say that's, that's the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, you're our guest. Would you like to go first? What did you think about the film, you know, on a scale of one to five Jewish stars, taking into account Jewish themes, Jewish content? Jewish cast and crew. I loved it when my parents took me to see it and rented it again on VHS. Yes, kids, back in the day, VHS. And I love it now. I love that it's a Broadway show now. Again, I know we can't talk about the Broadway show, but um, it just is so, I feel like regardless of what level of Judaism that you practice, whether you are 
Orthodox or Hasidic, even if you're not Jewish, it all comes down to values that everybody can relate to. Food, family, laughter, getting older. These are all things, no matter what religion you practice, they are going to affect you. And which is why I think this story is so special because yes, it is definitely a Jewish story, but I feel like everybody could get something out of it because of the values. So, so let's talk stars. Let's get down oh. to brass tacks. One to five. Oh God. Five. Okay. Five. Full Coming five. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very passionate. To me, it is a perfect Jewish film. <laughs> <laughs> perfectly imperfect because we are not perfect <laughs> absolutely so yeah Harry? that's a that's a yeah that's a great ranking i thought you made some really good arguments for why it wasn't explicitly like only jewish and then you came in with the five which kind of threw me for a loop but i'll, I'll pick up where you left off there because really okay <laughs> in terms of its jewishness you know sometimes with this ranking stuff we have to be clear we're not ranking the films you know the, the quality of the film i think all the films well most of the movies we've watched would exceed four or five stars amazing movies but in terms of its jewishness i did really like what you were just saying about some of those values and some of those themes of family and getting older you know one thing i noticed was that i read through a, i had a couple different options for the synopsis i was going to read at the top of this podcast mm -hmm. and none of them mentioned his Jewishness at all, you know, which could be, you know, for a couple of other reasons, but they were talking about, you know, an old, like an aging comic is reflecting on his wonder years, trying to reclaim his glory. And, you know, sometimes we divide this into sort of content theme. And I think the content of this film is certainly, there's so much Jewishness in there. And I love that. I loved seeing the Jewish text of it all. I loved seeing the Jewish food. I loved seeing the yarmulkes. I loved seeing, you know, just, his entire persona, his character was so Jewish. I think, you know, Billy Crystal embodied a really, I guess like the, the Billy Crystal model of like a, a very quick talking Jew, a very sort of like, you know, a lot of resorting to a lot of humor and a lot of just, you know, the sort of surface engagement. And I think, uh, you know, his, his brother Stan also was a kind of Jewish character. You'd see maybe a little bit more of that sort of meek, you know, kind of like quiet, not very confrontational version of a, of a sort of Jewish trope, but you know, there, there was so much Jewishness so clearly present there. So in terms of its content, you know, if I was giving like an individual ranking like that, that would be five stars. I mean, this was such a Jewish movie. Thematically, I, I do think a lot of what you touched on is Jewish in its own way. I think those values of, of family and of, you know, I guess, you know, just sort of like growing and aging and changing, you know, there's a lot of Jewishness there. But I also agree that there's just a lot of there's a universality to it. You know, this wasn't you could, you know, replace his Jewish background with, I guess, I don't know, with another sort of culture. And it wouldn't be it definitely would not be the same movie. I mean, there's so much to his persona that's Jewish, but you could argue some of those same themes. So, you know, with the universality kind of like pulling away at like some of the real explicit Jewishness, like I'm, I'm still going to give it four stars. It's not like it's not very Jewish, but, you know, I don't think it's up there at the five out of five. But yeah, th this was such a surprisingly Jewish movie. Like I, I, I you said were really before. surprised, eh? I really like. Had you not that, seen it before? I never had. I never. I was only familiar with it because I had read a couple months ago about the the Broadway show that Don he was doing, Dad. and I I was reading, <laughs> you know, a fun thing about how like you know he said you know back when I did this film I had to wear all this old age makeup and now I get to just play. Oh my the god, old I saw that part. clip too. Yeah. yeah, I just show up. So that just put it on my radar. But until I watched it, you know, as early as recently as this morning, I did not expect it to be as Jewish as it was. Oh, wow. I mean, to give to give Harry a little bit of credit as far as like the, the Jewishness of it all. And and Billy Crystal had a run of films where he was as previous guest of the podcast. Gil Barron explained like coded Jewish. Right. So he wasn't yep. like when Harry met Sally or City Slickers or something like that, you know. Oh no! I and and Harry, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I had like 10, 15 years on you too. So. This is all. This is all learning for me. So, That's why I'm doing so, this podcast. So yeah, and and I expand my horizons. No, and and my parents honestly like we're so nostalgic and my yeah. very nostalgic, and they're of a different time too, probably from your parents. So it's just. I don't blame you. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Appreciate laughs> I'm it. just, but, but, but this is, but this is like, my point is so few people know about this movie, you know, of, you know, Jewish people know about the, that this was yeah. in fact a movie. Like there's people who go to the Broadway show. They're like, what? This was a movie. No idea. Yeah. 
So Daniel, you know, yarmulkes, lack of yarmulkes, I should say, aside, how Jewish did you find the film to be? You know, I think looking at it, both of what you said was incredible as usual, you know, nothing less from you two. I think um, the content of the film was very Jewish, you know, from the brisket to the borscht belt to the, um, to the everything, you know, I didn't have another B thing to go to, but I think <laughs> overall this film like has so many Jewish elements thematically. I think, you know, it, it's universal, but it's also specific. Like I could also see this being like a Italian movie. So you substitute the food for spaghetti instead of brisket and you, you, you know, you, you change a few things around and I think the humor still works in that way. It's sort of universal, but there are some things that are specifically Jewish, whether it's the stepping on the glass or it's the, during the funeral, having a specific prayer, things like that. The borscht belt things kind of felt like, if you know, you know, sort of thing. And for us, we know. So we have that sort of Judar with a lot of that stuff. But like you said, it is sort of universal. I think cast and crew is something we didn't touch on yet, but it's like a very Jewish cast and crew. Um, it's Billy yeah. Crystal's directorial debut, so I got to give it some points for that. And it's his people, you know, Babalu Mandel and Lowell Gans. So uh, overall, Jerry Orbach's in there, uh, Jerry Lewis. So cast and crew is also pretty Jewish. I'm going to have to hover like three and a half, four stars, I think. And in again, not a, as a a rating of the quality of the film, but of the Jewishness of the film, right? So if we think of like Schindler's List and Fiddler on the Roof as like maybe fives in terms of themes and content. And this makes a lot of sense because I'm more of a spiritual humanistic hippie Jew. So that's why it's like, yes, this is Jewish. And like, from what I understand, you guys are more good Jews. (laughs) Uh, For those who are not- It's all relative. For those who are just listening to the podcast, Harry and I have long payas and black hats. Oh, you've never watched any of our social clips on uh, on Instagram or TikTok. I do have a beard. I play a rabbi on TV. I'm Jewish. Jewish, right. Exactly. That's That's my favorite line. So I think, you know, I think that's kind of where I'm sitting in the three and a half to four zone. But I did want to ask a really important question in all seriousness. Is this film good for the Jews? Good for the Jews, you know, <laughs> I don't, that's such a big question. I mean, people hate us, <laughs> so I'm kind of like, it's a really hard question to ask. Um, I know myself when I watch movies like this that hit so close to home, you know, there's really, I feel pride because a little bit off topic, but kind of similar Harvey Firestein's book, his biography, he was talking about how he was playing, you know, Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof. And he was telling the story of this little boy with Paeus who came to the stage door and was looking at him. He's like, are you really Jewish? And Harvey Firestein said, yeah, I am really Jewish. So for me, it's about, you know, we talk about And I always talk about that representation and, you know, like how these days representation is so important. And I feel like it's good because this is a story that so many people can relate to. And it's of a bygone era that is no longer out there. So is it good for the Jews? You know, I think I think it's just a good story and that a lot of people will relate to. That's my answer. Seamless. I totally hear you. Thanks, yeah. Jen. And Harry, what about you? Did you feel like this film was good for the Jews? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely identifiably Jewish, you know, so the prereq for this question is always like, if someone was watching this with, you know, little knowledge of Jews or just didn't expect a Jewish movie, would they recognize this as being, you know, Jewish? Would they see the Jews on screen? And I'd say for sure in this case, you know, in terms of good or bad, it's interesting because I really do love seeing just sort of complex layered Jewish characters. And as you know, as I mean, he, he's kind of like, but he's kind of like an antihero to a certain extent, because I don't always agree with him. And I definitely, you know, by the end of it, he is such a flawed character and he's someone that like, you know, we, we alluded to, you don't always see this in the film, but it's almost too late for redemption for him. You know, he can close some circles. He can, you know, make peace with some people, but nothing's going to make up for a sort of life of neglect that he's given to his daughter, that lack of gratitude he's shown to his brother the whole way. So, you know, he's not the most positive Jewish or positive character that, you know, you'd sort of want to emulate. And I think even, you know, Stan to to a certain extent is a little bit of this, like I I mentioned earlier, just this sort of like meek, you know, kind of quiet Jewishness. But 
I think the heart of, you know, Stan and of Elaine and just all of these characters and of their mother and of their family that kind of comes together at the end, in spite of that complexity, really does make this like, I, as much as I, I'm saying, I don't love this, like his character, Buddy's character, just leaving the film. I, I just, I really loved the world and I loved all these people together. And I just felt right? like, I, I really, it just felt, I, I felt warm. I, I was like, this is just a great you know, family that has, you know, struggled through a lot, but hopefully ultimately will just find peace and find happiness at the end, you know, living out, living their dreams out in Florida in front of retirement homes. So ultimately I left this. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope this is good for the Jews, but I, I would say so. I really think it was. Daniel, do you agree with that? Do you think not as much? No, no, no. no. He's shaking his head. I'm gonna, those I, listening, he I was, was like squinting my massively. eyes as you as you talked about it. I just feel like if we're looking at the main character of the film and we're kind of judging whether or not this was good for the Jews based on Buddy Young, I would say no. I feel like he's he's ultimately like a flawed character who doesn't redeem himself. He kind of like throws money at his problems. He's like, hey, here's a check that my brother gave me just to, you know, like he's alienated so many people in his life professionally. He's just shot himself in the foot so many times. I mean, I feel like his brother is like the, you know, it's kind of like a yin and yang. Right. And so without each other, they can't function. Even when Stan tries to get away, buddy brings him back, Buddy could have said, come back. And Stan could have said, no, I'm actually going to be attending my granddaughter's birthday party and forget it. You're on your audition. Ultimately, he came out for this audition that didn't end up to anything. But that's besides the point. What I'm trying to say is that I feel like if we're judging it based on Buddy alone, I would say, no, this is not a good film for the Jews because, you know, the other characters in his orbit are the sort of grounded level people. And he's this sort of eccentric not such a likable character. I don't necessarily feel like while I have nostalgia for the things in the film and like the brisket and the family, like that's a side, you know, that's not really the question. The question is like, if someone who's not a huge fan of the Jews watches this film, are they going to like the Jews more or less, you know? And so I would say probably this is not a good film for the Jews. That's my take. You know? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's just I where mean, I'm at. No, 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 for sure. <sighs> yeah. I could, I could get that. I can see that side too. I mean, that's yeah. the point of this podcast is to not agree to buy. I guess heads. my whole oh. thing is when I look at good fellas, sure, <laughs> and I see them, I'm like, is that good for the Italians? And I guess that's just me. Like, I it's one of my favorite movies. Sure. And I love all of those actors, just you know, with all my heart. That's not the first thought I, I go into, right? It's you know, because even Goodfellas, sorry, I don't even know why I picked that, but just. This is more of like a bonus round question. So this oh, doesn't, okay, yeah, cool. you know, this is, this is the sprinkles yeah. on top or the horse riders on the gefilte fish kind of thing. You know, it's like extra. Jen Stewart, thank you so much for being on the Jews on Film podcast to discuss your favorite movie, Mr. Saturday Night. Thank um, you. Why don't you plug your podcast and tell us where we can find it? Sure. So the Borscht Belt Tatler is going into its 51st episode. I don't know. It'll probably be more than that. Yeah. Every Monday, new episodes every Monday. And I stockpiled interviews. So this show is never going to end. That's amazing. Yeah. (laughs) And so where can people find that podcast? Wherever you get your podcasts. So iTunes, Spotify, Google, Buzzsprout and uh listen in fantastic thanks and anything else to plug keep your eyes out for the catskills museum there is an amazing group of people who are trying to put together a pop-up museum in ellenville new york details to follow there hasn't been an official announcement but it looks like it's probably very much going to happen so that's very exciting yeah harry anything to plug this week Nothing to plug this week. I mean, the Borscht Belt pod, you know, yeah. I'm going to be checking it out. I'm going to be listening to it as I sleep tonight. I encourage everyone to do the same. For sure. No schnitzel recipes, no tweaks this week. <laughs> Nothing this week. Okay. No. All right. Do you got anything, Daniel? No, I, I think I'm good. Happy springtime. You know, get out there, go enjoy some sun. Mazel tov to my niece who just had a bat mitzvah. I guess that's a Jewish plug. Uh-huh. Uh, Mazel tov. Leia, if you're listening. As always, you know, check us out at Jews on Film on Instagram. We're on TikTok as well, all the social media places. And uh, Jen Stewart, thank you so much again for being here. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you later. I'm going to go and play a little show at an old age home. Got to run, but I'll see you guys later. (laughs) See what you did there.
Oh, you see what I did there, huh? I see what you did there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. Jews on Film is hosted and produced by Daniel Zana and Harry Ottensaucer. Daniel Zana edited this episode. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Jews on Film and subscribe to our podcast to get new episodes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.